Uh, bonjour, uh, good morning. Uh, ce conférence de presse va dérouler en français et anglais. Chaque participant uh, va parler dans la langue de ses choix. Il n'y a pas de traduction qui va être offrir. Uh, good morning, I'll just say that in English, there won't be any translation. The participants will speak in the language of their choice. Mon nom est Marvin Rotran, je suis conseiller municipal à Montréal et avec ma collègue Juliana Fumagali, la mairesse de Villeray, Saint-Michel Park Extension, nous avons déposé une motion pour le conseil municipal du 14, 15 euh, décembre prochain qui demande la retraite des gaz lacrymogènes de l'arsenal de la service police de la ville de Montréal. Cette conférence de presse va exposer les raisons pour cette motion qui est basée sur le travail fait en la Chambre de commune par M. Matthew Green, membre du Parlement de Hampton Centre, qui a proposé une prohibition nationale et qui a lancé une pétition qui a 11 000 noms actuellement. Uh, Monsieur uh, Green va continuer ses travaux et espérant que la motion de Montréal est adoptée soit devenir un modèle pour que les autres grandes villes canadiennes puissent avoir le même débat. Uh, une chose est claire, que le gaz lacrymogène est utilisé souvent à Montréal. C'est difficile de savoir en 2020 combien des fois, mais c'était utilisé parmi les manifestations Black Lives Matter le 31 mai dernier utilisé le 7 juin, mais on doit attendre jusqu'à mi-2021 pour avoir le rapport annuel de la service police pour savoir combien d'utilisations il y a été. Mais si on fait une revue de tous les rapports annuels des dernières dix ans, c'est utilisé chaque année en 2012, 201 fois, incroyablement, et largement contre les manifestations pacifiques des étudiants cette année. En 2018, selon le rapport, c'était utilisé 29 fois, l'année dernière, 4 fois. Et pour nous autres, nous constatons que cette gaz est euh, illégale selon des traités internationaux pour utilisation en guerre. You can't use tear gas in war. It's banned by international treaties dating to 1925, reconfirmed in 1993. Mais on peut l'utiliser dans un contexte civil. Et ça euh, nous cause pause. La recherche demande plus et plus des mauvais impacts sur la santé des personnes aspergées avec le gaz lacrymogène. Et effectivement, également, se posent des questions selon toutes les recherches euh, euh, récentes concernant les droits civils et les droits garantis par la Charte canadienne et la Charte québécoise des droits et libertés. C'est utilisé trop souvent dernièrement comme une réaction aux manifestations autour de Black Lives Matter, pas seulement à Montréal, mais dans les États-Unis, beaucoup moins ailleurs. Mais c'est une interrogation euh, si les villes doivent agir. Dans les États-Unis, il y a plusieurs villes qui ont banni l'utilisation, ont fait un moratoire, euh, étant donné plus d'études. Le 14 décembre, le conseil municipal va être saisi d'une motion qui va noter les impacts sur la santé, mandater la commission de sécurité publique euh, pour commencer le travail pour retirer ça de euh, l'outil de la SPBM. Et troisièmement, inviter le Santé, euh, santé publique, Dr. Milan Drouin, de nous accompagner dans cette démarche. Je vois, avant de donner la parole aux euh, participants, j'aimerais les introduire. I'd like to introduce the speakers for today. First will be Matthew Green, the member of parliament of Hamilton Center for the New Democratic Party of Canada, who has raised this issue in parliament and started a petition that has garnered 11,000 names so far. Uh, Mr. Green va être suivi de um, uh, Mr. Victor Wong, an avocat international spécialisé dans les droits de l'homme. Uh, Mr. Victor Wong will follow Mr. Green. He is a international human rights lawyer, and he recently was part of uh, a groundbreaking research called the problematic legality of tear gas uh, under international human rights law. Il va être suivi de Mme Kara Zweibel, la directrice des libertés fondamentales de l'Association canadienne des libertés civiles. Uh, Mr. Wong will be followed by Ms. Zweibel, the director of fundamental liberties of the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, who uh, will tell us about their research into intermediate weapons and why they are calling, uh, among many other international organizations, for the withdrawal 
porque uh, Madame Swibel va être suivie par Madame Sharon Nelson, vice-présidente de l'Association Jamaïque de Montréal, qui parle au nom d'une coalition de 30 organisations de la société civile. Plusieurs de ces personnes sont avec nous aujourd'hui. Following the Swibel will be Sharon Nelson, vice president of the Jamaica Association of Montreal, who is speaking for a you know, 30 civil organizations, um, many of which are with us here today, and I welcome them. Uh, Madame Nelson va être suivie par uh, Monsieur Fonniemi, le directeur général de la Centre de recherche action sur les relations raciales, uh, qui va parler uh, de l'impact de l'utilisation des gaz lacrymogènes uh, sur les manifestations uh, uh, pacifiques. Mr. Nemi, the executive director of the Center for Research Action of, uh, on Race Relations, will follow Mr. Miss Nelson. And the last speaker will be Sarah Mazzaro, la dernière personne pour prendre la parole, va être Sarah Mazzaro, uh, qui est ici pour la Concordia, uh, Union des étudiants de Concordia, the Concordia Students' Union. Donc, sans délai, je donne la parole à Monsieur Matthew Green. I welcome Mr. Matthew Green and I invite him to address the press conference. Thank you very much, Councillor Rotron. I have to begin by first thanking you for continuing this very important work for banning the use of chemical weapons against civilian populations in Canada. I think that it's important to note that the impetus of this call came from the public. It came directly from the civilian population. Uh, the petition that we undertook in the House of Commons was initiated by Kurt Ava in response to reports of tear gas used in Montreal, but clearly the numerous times in which police have used tear gas in densely populated major cities. As mentioned, this has been banned in warfare both in 1929 and by 1993, it has been deemed chemical weapons under, under convention. We know that tear gas can cause death, miscarriage, and significant long-term health effects to those who are exposed by it. We know that tear gas is an indiscriminate weapon which can affect both the targeted individuals and bystanders alike. And I think that that is a very important consideration given the, the basic features of natural law and justice within Canada. It's also important to note that the petition that was signed by over 11,000 Canadians was responded to by the Minister of Public Safety. We indeed agree that this is a public safety issue and that the use of tear gas against civilian populations goes against the precautionary principles of, of public safety. We know that it is not in fact an a adequate use of crowd control as is reported by police because we can see the reaction and response, the panic that it causes communities who are exercising their charter rights of freedom of assembly. This increases tension. It often provokes violence. And I think it's also important to note that tear gas used specifically during a global pandemic greatly increases the risk of COVID-19 spread and is made much more dangerous by these conditions. And so, uh, we not only encourage police to prioritize de-escalation over dispersal and arrest tactics, but I think what we're hearing from the public and the many incredible civic organizations representing you know, thousands of people in your community of Montreal and of course, hundreds of thousands of people across the country is that we believe it is within the public interest to completely curtail the use of tear gas. I wanna just spend a brief moment and highlight uh, the response from the minister. Of course, for those that engage in petitions, you should know at the federal level that it is one of the only and few forms of direct democracy where the citizenry can request a question on a way of petition and receive a response from the ministry. And so we did receive a response from the parliamentary secretary, Joel Lightbound from the Ministry of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. <laughs> which focused most of the response on this use by members of the RCMP. And of course, it will be the minister's position that they are only in control of police uh, 
as outlined through the RCMP. I would argue that the Minister of Public Safety has a federal role and responsibility to have and provide federal restrictions and bans on such things as the use of chemical weapons. Of course, we've seen that with recent gun legislation. And I think it's important to note that these chemicals are indeed classified as weapons. Therefore, we also you know, support the, the local work uh, under the municipal purview of councillor uh, in Montreal. But we, we would suggest further to that, that there needs to be a federal ban on the use of chemical weapons, understanding that uh, municipalities across the country are perhaps much slower to respond to this. We should also note that in the time of this petition that uh, the military had engaged in the procurement of these weapons, presumably either for training purposes or through distribution. We are unclear about that. And uh, we should also note, of course, that in response to the call for the military use that we did receive a response from the Minister of National De Defense, which talks at length about the training. Uh, but we, you know, I think it's important to note that in instances of significant mass assembly, that the military is at times called in for domestic crowd control and therefore we think should be bound by the same conventions that they would be bound by internationally. And so those are my uh, remarks, Councillor Rotran, and I just wanna end by again, thanking you and all of the incredible civic organizations who are leading this in Montreal and all the boroughs and constituencies there. It's indeed a pleasure and honor to join you here in this important call this morning. Uh, merci, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Green. I uh, want to note that there are representatives of civil society with us today, including representatives of the Black Community Resource Center, the Federation of Filipino Associations of Quebec, uh, CRAR, the Council of South uh, Asian uh, is with us and several others. As I pointed out, it's an issue that is important to Montrealers and there are 30 organizations working. Uh, pour les journalistes, faut uh, savoir, c'est très difficile d'avoir un portrait exact de ce qui arrive au niveau national. On sait que le gaz lacrymogène est utilisé souvent à Montréal. Ailleurs, c'est très difficile d'avoir toutes uh, les statistiques. Uh, à Toronto, la était était en 2010 avec l'utilisation massive de cet uh, outil chimique pendant le G20, le G20 en 2010. Et depuis ce temps-là, il y a uh, vraiment des efforts des élus, des conseils municipaux de Toronto, de contrôler ça, d'assurer que ce n'est pas utilisé. Ma, mon, uh, je, je pense, je ne peux pas le prouver, mais je pense qu'à Montréal, c'est utilisé plus que dans les autres forces policières au Canada, une des raisons pour lesquelles on veut euh, soulever cette question au Conseil municipal. Uh, I'm going to now ask uh, Vincent Wong, who is currently at York University, uh, to address us. Uh, Mr. Wong and other researchers from the University of Toronto recently issued some groundbreaking research called the problematic legality of tear gas under international human rights law. It's making waves and headlines internationally, and it pinpoints what is happening in many countries where legal, lawful, peaceful dissent is being attacked by mass use of tear gas that affects everyone at a demonstration, including those who are simply exercising uh, recognize legal rights in various charters. Uh, Mr. Wong, I invite you to take the floor. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Councillor Rochand and everybody here. Uh, you know, uh, merci à tous for, for being here today, especially to the civil society organizations um, that uh, are, are speaking out from the community and have been uh, for, for many, many years, even before uh, this sort of renewed attention to this particular issue. Uh, so as the councillor mentioned, my name is Vincent Wong. Um, we put out this report uh, in September 2020, and I was one of the co-authors along with Maya Fiorante and Natasha Williams. 
uh, and it was published by the International Human Rights Program at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law. Um, the state of legality for the use of tear gas is actually highly fraught and uh, particularly when it is put up to its historical context and updated for new information about what we know about tear gas, how it is used to police demonstrations as a matter of fact, and greater understanding about its health effects. And I'd like to situate, you know, our conversation here today as part of a larger conversation. As Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Green said, this is uh, really a conversation that is coming from communities, coming from the grassroots about the role of military equipments and technologies in policing civilians and part of the political and policy discourse around demilitarizing the police that is happening internationally. So I will uh, talk a little bit about um, what our report found and then I, I, I can expand in, in any way um, if people would like in the Q&A. Uh, but generally what we found in this research was that the use of tear gas has really increased worldwide and in many places has become the weapon of choice for policing assemblies um, as in places like Iran, Hong Kong, uh, the United States and Belarus uh, for, for some uh, contemporary examples. And its use globally is expected to increase further uh, as demand from law enforcement increases with respect to these uses. Now used as an aerial weapon, that means uh, deployed via a dispersal mechanism, which is frequently canisters. Uh, tear gas is inherently, inherently indiscriminate and frequently abused when deployed against peaceful assemblies, uh, in closed spaces, and in excessive quantities as against uh, vulnerable populations. There is hardly a case uh, from what we found in the research where it is deployed in a fashion that complies with the principles of necessity and proportionality. Now, tear gas itself has an immense power, uh, much more so in many ways than other um, uh, uh, riot control options or crowd control options to effectively preclude or completely crush the right to peaceful protest, free speech rights, and the right to assembly, uh, which are protected in international human rights treaties and in Canada, of course, constitutionally protected through the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Tear gas cannot distinguish, cannot distinguish between the young and elderly, the healthy and sick, the peaceful and the militant. It causes myriad health harms, uh, some of which have already been covered here, uh, whether somebody is a rally goer or just a bystand, uh, bystander. Uh, and it has found to be, um, especially in urban settings, seep in and affect the homeless who have uh, very little place to go. Uh, studies have shown that increased probability of uh, there's increased probability of contracting respiratory illness, which is particularly salient uh, now that we are in a global pandemic, as Mr. Green uh, uh, stated. Now, despite these risks and human rights violations associated with tear gas, there is actually no international agreement that governs trade and manufacture of tear gas, which leads the market largely unregulated, completely unaccountable. And uh, many of these manufacturers, there is scant trade data. We don't know uh, the, the formula in a lot of these tear gas uh, canisters, and there is no published policies on ethics or human rights. Now to go to the international legality portion, tear gas is banned under the Chemical Weapons Convention which is a law and war or a humanitarian, international humanitarian law treaty. However, the convention exempts the use of riot control agents for law enforcement purposes. And when you contextualize this historically, this is best explained as a matter of political expediency and political lobbying during these conventions uh, rather than principled human rights rationale. We have also found that there's international guidance on the use of tear, tear gas in law enforcement, but it has proven to be very vague and largely ineffective in curbing its use um, uh, and abuse for human rights violations. So tear gas use operates in this unique legal vacuum, and it is the only area of international law that you know, we're aware of in which international human rights protections 
are actually trying to catch up to the law of war protections, right? It usually is the opposite way around. And this situation is uh, unacceptable and needs to be rectified immediately. So in, in closing, I would just say that tear gas should be banned in international law in, pro, in line with its prohibition in the law of war. And uh, the good news is that there is an emerging international human rights norm in which the UN, international rights groups, domestic governments, and uh, international and regional courts are signaling a growing recognition uh, towards restricting its use and trade um, as a crowd control device and really understanding now the, the health effects um, and the crushing effect that it has on fundamental rights and freedoms and is uh, moving towards that norm of, of prohibition. And so uh, I will uh, leave it there and, and thank you very, very much um, for your attendance here today. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Wong, and thank you for the research uh, that uh, you helped to publish in September. Uh, I'm hearing that it is really giving hope to democratic movements in many countries in the world, and it's getting a lot of reaction uh, on the internet just about from everywhere. I'm going to uh, now invite uh, Kara Zweibel, the uh, Director of Fundamental Freedoms for the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, to tell us about the position of CCLA. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rochon. And thank you for the invitation. And thank you to, uh, to everyone for, for being here. Um, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association supports the community's efforts to restrict and ultimately eliminate the use of tear gas by police officers in Montreal and indeed across Canada. Um, the freedom to protest is a fundamental one that is protected by our constitution. Tear gas is a tool to suppress protest and free speech and its use only serves to undermine the public's trust in police, something that is already fragile. L'Association Canadienne de Liberté Civile a pris sans réserve les démarches de celles et ceux-ci présents de la communauté au large, qui visent non seulement l'élimination de l'usage du gaz lacrymogène par le service de police de la ville de Montréal, mais par tous nos services policiers d'un bout à l'autre du Canada. Le droit fondamental à la manifestation est protégé par la Constitution. Le gaz lacrymogène est un outil qui étouffe la liberté d'expression et de manifester. Son usage ne fait qu'accroître l'érosion des liens de confiance déjà fragilisés avec nos services de police. CCLA is obviously not alone in its opposition to the use of tear gas as a so-called crowd control weapon. Um, in addition to the other organizations uh, and speakers that are represented here today, CCLA is a member of an international network of civil li liberties organizations known as INCLO, which has done a great deal of work on the use of these weapons, um, both on its own and in conjunction with uh, physicians for human rights, noting that their use can have significant health consequences and chill peaceful dissent. Police have tools at their disposal to deal with people who are acting unlawfully during a protest. They need not and should not use tear gas, an indiscriminate weapon that doesn't differentiate between those breaking the law, those peacefully protesting, or those observing, including journalists. In our view, it's time to get these weapons out of the hands of police officers, and we're proud to support a motion that seeks to do just that. And I will leave it there. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Zweibel. Uh, maintenant, j'invite Sharon Nelson, qui est uh, de l'Association Jamaïque de Montréal, qui parle pour une coalition de 30 groupes uh, de la société civile. I'm going to invite Sharon Nelson, the president of the Jamaica Association, to speak on behalf of a coalition of civil society, 30 groups that are supporting the motion. Uh, Ms. Nelson. Good morning, and thank you for having me uh, in this uh, important co conference. Um, as stated, um, this past summer, uh, there were a number of incidents where tear gas was used, and that has been detrimental for a number of people on, on the ground that are um, protesting and um, you know, uh, sharing their rights or ex exhibiting their rights to protest things that are really important in the city um, and to have their voices heard. As was said by Minister Green, this is one of the ways in which um, people are heard 
uh, peaceful protests are one way that people are heard and they, as uh, is protected under laws here, um, we do have that right to protest and protest peacefully. Now, um, with respect to the Jamaica Association and, and the many groups, the 30 community groups that sign a, a, uh, are behind this motion, uh, as of this summer, we want the city to immediately commit to withdrawing tear gas from use in Montreal. Cities such as, um, and we want the city council to follow cities such as Seattle, Portland, Pittsburgh, and New Orleans who have already done so. Um, they are an example for the SPVM and for Montreal to follow. And uh, given what was already said about the indiscriminate nature of this uh, of tear gas, there's just, the impacts are just unending and it's just a repercussion after repercussion and the use of this banned war um, agent. So um, we, well, uh, we strongly ask that Montreal City Council follow suit and follow these uh, exemplary cities in the US and others around the world that have already placed a moratorium or put restricted bans on the use of tear gas for crowd control. Thank you so much. Uh, merci, Madame Nelson. Uh, J'inviterai maintenant M. Fauniami de uh, Crar de prendre la parole. Cet organisme est uh, bien branché uh, aux minorités visibles à Montréal, qui comporte 33 % de la population de, de la ville de Montréal, uh, et est impliqué uh, dans les manifestations en mai et juin dernier pour uh, Black Lives Matter et a entendu beaucoup des gens qui étaient aspergés, des gens qui effectivement ont voulu démontrer leur opinion légalement, pacifiquement, mais euh, à, à trouver que leurs droits étaient brimés. Euh, Monsieur euh, Némé, je vous euh, demande de prendre la parole. Oui, maintenant on entend. Oui. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Rotran. Nous appuyons de manière assez euh, enthousiaste et rigoureuse, vigoureuse cette motion parce que nous n'avons pas encore oublié les manifestations étudiantes de 2012. Euh, plusieurs scènes d'intervention de 2012 restent encore dans la mémoire collective ici au Québec et dans le reste du Canada, par rapport à la manière dont les jeunes étudiants qui manifestaient et qui s'exprimaient euh, quant à leur position face à la scolarité, aux frais de scolarité, ont été, euh, disons, exposés à ce que nous remettons en question aujourd'hui. L'utilisation souvent de manière abusive et excessive du gaz lacrymogène comme méthode de contrôle des foules. Euh, la motion est une invitation très importante pour le conseil municipal de se prononcer sur une question qui devrait faire partie de la remise en question de la révision de la réforme actuellement euh, qui a lieu actuellement à Québec sur la, réf la réforme policière sur les services de police euh, pour le Québec des années à venir. C'est un débat essentiel au niveau de l'équilibre entre la sécurité publique et les droits et libertés de la personne qui sont garantis par les chartes des droits et libertés tant canadiennes que québécoises. Ce qui nous importe aussi, c'est qu'au moment où on parle de la santé publique et surtout la question de la, de la santé des personnes, des populations vulnérables dans des milieux urbains, L'utilisation du gaz lacrymogène, certainement, devrait être une préoccupation, comme l'a souligné la motion de la direction de la santé publique de Montréal, donc, qui devrait aussi s'exprimer sur cette question. Donc, nous appuyons cette motion qui va au-delà de la question de la, de la santé publique ou des droits et libertés de la personne, mais ça fait partie d'un mouvement de plus en plus... Euh, Euh, disons euh, évident et de plus en plus énergie, énergétique pour remettre en question certaines méthodes et certains moyens d'intervention euh, des services de police dans des centres urbains euh, ici au Québec et dans le reste du pays. Donc euh, nous espérons que le conseil municipal va appuyer cette motion et va donner suite à des recommandations très concrètes qu'elle propose par rapport aux services de police pour les années à venir. Merci. Ah, merci, M. Niami. Avant la période des questions du journaliste, j'invite Mme Sarah Mazzaro de l'Union des étudiants de Concordia d'expliquer de, de l'appui qu'il donne à ces motions au nom de la communauté de l'Université de Concordia. Mme Mazzaro, la, la, la parole est le vote. Thank you and thank you for having me um, this morning. Um, so, cette, uh, cette résolution est dans la plus haute importance pour l'Union étudiante de Concordia et pour 
et pour toutes les étudiants de Montréal, en raison du danger réel représentant les effets des néfestes des gaz lacrymogènes sur la santé et de la menace qu'ils représentent pour ceux qui sont exercés leurs droits humains et leur liberté d'expression. Maple Spring 2012, tens of thousands of students have declared a strike and are peacefully protesting planned tuition fee increases when they are met by Montreal riot police, launching volleys of toxic tear gas into the crowd, sending many civilians stumbling away, coughing and rubbing at their eyes. International Workers' Day, May 1st, 2015, hundreds of workers, teachers and students are rallying against government reforms, reducing funding to social services, when they are dispersed by police, shooting tear gas into the crowds, poisoning innocent bystanders, children, and other pedestrians. May 31st, 2020, thousands of people, young and old, gather for a peaceful demonstration in support of George Floyd, Regis Korczynski, Paquette, and to call for action against racism and police brutality against racialized communities, when the Montreal police responded by firing toxic tear gas at a large crowd, already at risk because of COVID-19. À Montréal, le gaz relacrymogène n'est presque jamais utilisé de manière légale, nécessaire et proportionné par la police lors des manifestations. Au contraire, il est souvent utilisé de son discernement pour dépenser des fils largement pacifiques. Throughout the Concordia Student Union's history, we have been actively participating in peaceful protests for social justice. Unfortunately, tear gas has been weaponized against our vulnerable student population and has facilitated the militarization of police in Canada, resulting in a culture where civilians are treated as enemy combatants. For these reasons, the Concordia Student Union calls for the immediate banning of the use of tear gas by Montreal police. Thank you. Uh, merci, uh, Madame Azzaro. Avant la période de questions, uh, juste uh, quelques notes. Il y a un lien avec la copie de motion, le communiqué, soit en français ou en anglais, uh, et quelques documents d'appui qui sont facilement accessibles pour tous les journalistes. Uh, un rappel, la motion va être débattue au Conseil du 14 décembre, probablement l'après-midi du 15 décembre. Ce que tous les gens ont dit, il y a Uh, uh, des problèmes de santé liés à l'utilisation de uh, uh, cet outil gaz lacrymogène, mais aujourd'hui, uh, la concentration de ces conférences de presse est qu'effectivement, ça devienne une arme contre tout le droit de manifester pacifiquement et contre les droits garantis dans les chartes uh, canadiennes et les chartes uh, québécoises. Uh, Said, comme M. Wang a dit, an area weapon, an arm, qui touche tout in the zone. C'est indiscriminé. Faites pas une um, différenciation entre celles qui brise la loi et la grande majorité des personnes. Une manifestation, c'est uh, traite tout le monde comme ils ont fait une violation d'une loi. Donc, il y a des sérieuses questions à poser sur cet outil qui est uh, depuis presque 20 ans bannir uh, pour utilisation dans le contexte de guerre, mais être utilisé de plus et plus dans le contexte civil. I invite the journalists to ask their questions. J'invite les journalistes. On va commencer en français. S'il y a des questions, faites signal et ce va être distribué à un membre de la panel. Do we have any questions in French or in English? Marvin, oui. Mr. Rotrend. Oui, moi, je vais juste quand même... Euh... Je veux quand même que ma voix soit entendue et parce que ce n'est pas juste une question d'appuyer une motion. Je pense qu'il est important euh, d'appuyer euh, la motion et qu'au conseil municipal, on nous entende. Parce que, et, et lorsque Marvin m'a demandé d'appuyer cette motion, ça a été vraiment un peu, euh, comme M. Némi a dit, et, et les autres ont dit, sans réserve. Euh, C'est impossible de ne pas appuyer cette motion. Euh, on parle de plus en plus du SPVM dans différentes sphères. Et donc, euh, et il est évident que le retrait des gaz lacrymogènes doit être vraiment euh, appuyé par tous au conseil municipal. C'est une question de justice sociale, de respect de nos droits et libertés. Et effectivement, comme plusieurs intervenants ont mentionné, une des premières fois où on voit cette utilisation, c'est à Toronto lors du G20. 
Ensuite, de façon, euh, je, je pense au niveau historique, jamais vu à Montréal lors des manifestations étudiantes, euh, auxquelles j'ai participé et auxquelles plusieurs d'entre nous ont participé en appui aux étudiants. Et aussi, euh, en, en mai, euh, le 1er mai 2015, en tant que syndicaliste, aussi en tant qu'élu municipal, avec mon fils, lors euh, des manifestations le 31 mai dernier euh, en appui à Black Lives Matter. Il est important pour nous, en tant que citoyens, de savoir que nous pouvons aller dans les rues et être entendus et sans avoir peur à notre santé. Et le SPVM doit commencer à utiliser de plus en plus d'autres méthodes de dés désescalation et ne pas utiliser des armes. Parce que c'est de ça dont on parle. On parle d'une arme. Alors, envers une population civile qui demande à faire respecter ses droits et libertés. Sur ce, je vous remercie. Euh, merci, euh, Mère euh, Fumagali. Euh, bon, j'invite encore les questions de journalistes. Une chose est claire, qu'à Montréal, c'est euh, gaz lacro est utilisé souvent, euh, se sent plus que les autres villes canadiennes, mais les participants aujourd'hui appuient euh, une prohibition nationale. On commence avec Montréal, c'est dans notre champ juridiction. Euh, mais il y a plusieurs personnes qui ont mentionné 2012 et les manifestations étudiantes à Montréal. Il y a vraiment 201 utilisation des gaz lacrymogènes. Incroyable de croire, mais c'était arrivé. Moins depuis, mais chaque fois c'est utilisé, c'est cible tout le monde dans une manifestation. Pas celle des rares personnes qui possiblement à faire un méfait, qui peut être traité dans les autres manières, mais c'est cible tout le monde. Et il y a des questions posées par M. Wang et les autres qui effectivement euh, mettent la lumière sur la de brimer les droits garantis dans les chartes par l'utilisation de cette, euh, cette arme. Donc, euh, euh, Madame de euh, euh, Galper de Metro, avez-vous des questions? Euh, non, pas, pas nécessairement. Peut-être juste euh, rapidement, euh, est-ce que, est que vous êtes positif là, en, en vue de, du débat qu'il va y avoir euh, au conseil municipal? Est-ce que vous pensez que ça va être bien accueilli euh, de la part du, du conseil municipal? Ça, je ne peux pas vous dire en avance, mais je pense qu'il y a un changement d'attitude au Conseil des dernières quelques années. Euh, les élus, soit de la côté de la majorité ou de la côté de l'opposition officielle, sont beaucoup plus conscients de la nécessité de protéger les droits civils et d'assurer que euh, l'octroi de services de sécurité publique est fait avec le moindre utilisation de force. Le Conseil a déjà été saisi de quelques débats concernant les pistolets d'impulsion euh, électrique, les hautes armes et a pris la position que le déamorcement, le déescalation est la façon de le faire. Euh, nous sommes au courant des débats à Toronto, la motion adoptée là-bas. Nous sommes au courant des débats à Vancouver où les élus commencent à repenser comment les policiers vont faire euh, leur tâche dans l'avenir. Mm -hmm. Le rapport de l'Office de consultation publique de Montréal qui a ciblé des problèmes de racisme systémique et qui a invité le SPVM de changer leur façon de faire et de, de regarder les relations avec les minorités visibles et les autres minorités à Montréal. Les élus sont au courant et avancent les réformes pour effectivement réimaginer la police de l'avenir. Donc, euh, encore pour répondre à votre question, on va voir, mais euh, mes motions dans le passé étaient traitées avec respect et largement adoptées telles quelles. Je sais qu'il y a des élus des deux côtés, soit de Projet Montréal, soit de Ensemble Montréal, qui a déjà m'a contacté pour me dire qu'il a pris euh, la motion. On va voir dans les prochains jours. C'était toujours une négociation, mais j'ai des espoirs. Génial. Mais je vous remercie. Merci. Euh, Est-ce que Mme Roy de Radio-Can a une question? 
C no. I'm going to ask whether C CTV has a question. I note that you're on on the call. Is there a question from the CFCF editors? Marvin, you have a question from Cult Montreal. Tim. Hi, Tim. How are you? Uh, in the chat, it says, what more humane crowd control tools or methods are used by police elsewhere when actually necessary? Question mark alternatives. Uh, can I ask Vincent Wong and Matthew Green to respond to that? I'm certainly happy to share my perspective uh, without it being precise in a comparative way. But I would suggest to you that these are fundamental questions about the role of police and keeping the peace juxtaposed to the democratic rights of the freedom of assembly. And so while we hear that police are trained on de-escalation, it is also true that we have seen egregious uses of these immediate shifts towards uh, the escalation of the use of force, whether it be through the militarization of police as presented in riot gear, uh, you know, complete with uh, uh, mounted units and tear gas. And I think it begs the question of what is police's role within the context of peaceful assembly. And I think that the language of what is peaceful assembly is often what's debated. And the framing of what is violent is often what is debated. And there, in my opinion, it is often the case that there is a false equivalency between uh, vandalism and violence that I would suggest to you the use of the escalation of the use of force by law enforcement to civilians constitutes violence and the civilian destruction of property constitutes vandalism and the destruction of property. And those are often two very separate things. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll jump on to some of Mr. Green's comments um, as well, because this is usually the uh, immediate question or the uh, that that pops into folks heads when we um, discuss the issue of, of police use of tear gas. Um, but really, I mean, uh, the use of tear gas is only one tiny, um, you, you know, like option in terms of a police response to uh, protests and uh, to assembly. And so uh, there are, you know, like, uh, I, I think far from us to be here uh, thinking about, you know, how to perfectly do the police's job. Um, th this is, uh, you, you know, it kind of papers over the the immense power that this particular um, uh, this particular weapon that tear gas has in effectively crushing the right to peaceful protest and free speech. And that's kind of what we're here to talk about today. Of course, if you uh, ban uh, tear gas without dealing with the broader policy consideration that we're, we're talking about in policy and in the public about what does uh, police mean? What is the relationship to police and the citizenry and uh, democratic protest? Um, then that will not accomplish very much, right? Just banning tear gas will not accomplish very much if the knee-jerk reaction is to use even more violent, if more discriminate sort of force. So really, it has to be part and parcel of this reconceptualization of changes in policing culture, of the demilitarization of the police. And it's not really even just about the police in a democratic society, right? So often is um, protest, sometimes rancorous protest, due to political issues, due to root causes uh, privations of people's uh, life necessities, crises in people's lives that police are called to respond to, but really it should be the job of politicians, elected officials, uh, to respond to those very, very important calls from the citizenry. And so when we have something that is so uh, eminently powerful in causing fear and suppressing uh, protest, like the use of, of tear gas, it's such an easy out for political leaders that really need to be accountable to all of their constituency, including those on the street calling for um, social justice or social change. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Wong. Uh, Tim, the city of Toronto 
adopted a motion a few months ago that really starts on the road to rethinking and reimagining police response in all sorts of contexts. And I'm actually asking the city of Montreal to have the same debate as well, not just with this motion, but with a broader motion that will also be debated. In Toronto, a pilot project has just begun in Scarborough Borough, where when a person is having a mental health crisis or there may be a drug dependency issue, uh, it's not the typical response of sending two police officers anymore. In fact, they're sending two civilians, one of whom has some specialized training in mental health issues. And when it's an indigenous person, the other respondent is a First Nations person. The idea is to de-escalate and to do it differently. And this is actually a step forward for the city of Toronto. And they are rethinking all their responses. It's not gonna be immediate. This is a medium term type of a project. And that's what can happen here as well uh, with how police perceive policing or providing security during what is a legal, uh, constitutionally protected demonstration. And the answer isn't, well, there may be problems with a few people, so we're going to make sure that no one can demonstrate. That's where the change has to come. And I quite agree with Vincent. It starts with politicians, particularly at the city council level. The SPVM's a municipal police force. And while under law, they report to the minister in Quebec, we do have certain authority. And there is a symbiotic relationship between they and us through the Public Security Commission. So it's our role to represent our citizens who are saying this just isn't right and this is not the type of response that should occur. Are there any other questions? Est-ce qu'il y a des autres questions, des autres personnes sur l'appel? Any questions from anyone on the, the call? If not, I'm gonna ask if anyone wants to make some final comments, in which case I will Thank. I, I do. I do have one. Uh, the organizer in me, Council Rotron, for those that are watching, how can people provide support to your motion? When is the motion coming up and, and what, you know, what can be done there for people to be involved in supporting this? Excellent. Uh, Council, uh, 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 Mr. Green, I'm going to send you the, I think you'll have it already, but I'll send you the motion in French with the unofficial English translation. You can post it where you want and share it with the petitioners. I'll also uh, indicate how you can inform Montreal City Council if you support this motion um, and, you know, where to uh, where to uh, send an email or, or, or a letter. Um, as well, uh, there is a link today which you can share with everyone, which includes several documents that are quite educational, which talk about health impact and which talk about the uh, erosion of civil rights and which talk about the um, international human rights situation in regard to, to uh, tear gas use. Um, I think all that will help. And I would invite, I'm going to be inviting Montrealers to sign your petition as well. And you might in return uh, ask people to get the information that we'll share with you out nationally so that we can have a national response to the debate. As well, I'll send you a link that people can watch us debating this, which will probably be on the afternoon of the 15th of December, although I can't say for sure because I don't control the ebb and flow of the debate. Uh, it's the third to last item on the council agenda, but I'll make sure that you have all the information for your mailing list. Merci beaucoup à tout le monde. Thank you to my invited guests from Ontario. We really appreciate it that you were with us this morning. Uh, merci aux journalistes qui étaient avec nous aujourd'hui et surtout merci au groupe de la Société Civile qui a pris cette motion et à tous ceux qui ont parlé aujourd'hui. Un grand merci de Madame Pumagali et moi-même. Merci. This uh, conference is now officially closed. <laughs>